Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Radical Candor Podcast. I am Kim Scott, co-founder of Radical Candor and author of the books Radical Candor and Just Work, not to mention three unpublished novels. And I'm Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the Radical Candor Podcast. And Kim, I think you did mention the author of three, <laughs> just, just the spirit of clarity. Oh, sure I did. Yes. On the last episode, we talked about the responsibilities of managers of small teams. Today, we're going to talk about what managers of managers do at work. And we did touch on this a couple episodes ago. We'll put that in the show notes when we spoke about quiet quitting. But today, it's all about the role of manager of managers. And so, first of all, let's talk about what are we actually talking about here when we say a manager of managers? We are defining the transition when someone goes from managing that small team to a large team is this manager of managers. Kim, what is the difference here? The difference is that if you're managing people who manage other people, then you're managing managers. Whereas if you're managing individual contributors, then you're managing a team. And so I think that the big difference when you become a manager of managers is that now you have to become a thought partner, not only on the task at hand. So if you're a manager of engineers, you're a thought partner for the engineering project. Or if you're a manager of salespeople, you're a thought partner for their, uh, their, their sales uh, efforts. But if you're a manager of someone who manages engineers or a manager of someone who manages salespeople, now you have to be a thought partner to them, not just on the functional expertise and the business that they're running or the, or the product that they're building, but you also have to be a thought, thought partner to them on how they're managing their team. And this is important and complicated because you've got to, when you're a manager of managers, you need to set up some processes that both empower those managers you're managing. Sorry, there's a lot of management in this, in this explanation. But you've also got to make sure that those folks don't have too much power, that the managers you are managing aren't acting like jerks. You're protecting the people who work for the people who work for you. And one of the other things that makes it kind of complicated is that people love to hate middle managers. But when you are managing managers, it is your job to love them uh, and to maximize the chances that others do too, that they don't become these people who ruin your culture. Well, we're really teeing up quite an episode where we're learning how to love the people that people love to hate and trying not to use the word managers too many times in one episode. We'll keep track. <laughs> Jason, one of the things that we were talking about as we we're setting up this, this episode was about this distinction between small team and large team. And Kim is saying from her perspective, it's really about being the thought partner for the manager of managers. Can you reflect on what you heard Kim say and your perspective on small versus large teams? Yeah, I was arguing in that conversation that we had off air that teams start to feel large when you introduce the idea of a manager of managers. And usually teams start to feel large right before you introduce a manager of managers, because that role gets introduced when you realize that you are managing 12 or 15 or maybe even 20, uh, gasp, 20 people yourself. And you're, you're realizing it's, I need help. I can't, I can't directly manage all of these folks by myself. So you start the process of thinking, what, what do I do next? And the next logical step is to introduce a, another manager to take on at least part of the team. And one of the ways, Amy, that teams can get big uh, is exactly as Jason said. I mean, at, at one point at Google, for example, they were so loath to have managers of managers that there were several people at the company who had 65, 75, 85 direct reports, which meant that there was no management. <laughs> There was no management. And it turned out, actually, that people really longed to have a, a good man. Nobody longs to have a bad boss, but people wanted someone to do the things that managers do. And so they had to introduce this layer without introducing the kind of power dynamics that will 
create weenies of the middle managers, uh, for lack mm. of a more technical term. Kim, it's interesting you bring in this this longing for good managers. <laughs> I want to explore the longing from the other side, which is, does anyone long to be a manager of managers? Of course they do, but usually for the wrong reasons. But <laughs> sometimes people think that if they're you know, a boss of bosses, then then they won't have to do any work. There was one guy who I knew, a person from my personal life, we'll just leave it at that, who called me up and said he wanted me to help him get a CEO role. And there was a role I knew of that was open, and it was a COO role. And I said to him, well, how about this role? And he said, oh, no, I have to be the CEO. And I said, why do you have to be the CEO? And he said, because if I'm the CEO, then people have to deal with my neuroses. And if I'm not the CEO, then I have to <laughs> deal with their neuroses. And I'm like, how about we try to deal with our own neuroses, you know? Um, so I think very often people think that they're going to get power when they become a manager of managers. And that is the wrong reason. So in my experience, the people who I promoted to become managers and also the people who I promoted to become managers of managers, sorry uh, about this. If this is becoming a drinking to, game, there, there were, <laughs> now there's a lot of shots being had. They were the reluctant managers. They were the people who didn't really want the, to, to be whatever that, but they cared about, but they cared about people and they cared about the product. And they realized that in order to help the folks they were working with achieve something, they had to take on those responsibilities. I think the reason why a reluctant manager is more likely to not sort of let the power go to their head is because they're they see value in what they are currently doing as an individual contributor, if it's a promotion to management. So they, they see what they're doing as, as valuable. They care about it. And so that transition from individual contributor to manager, you're actually trying to convince them that there's this other set of skills that you could apply, that, that I think you have an aptitude for that you could apply that actually could have a leveraged effect, meaning your effort could have a bigger impact if you, as a, as a manager, you could help that thing that you care about in a different way and maybe even have, have a bigger impact as a result. And the same thing is true in the transition from manager to manager of managers. Like the, the skill set, people tend to look in that position, tend to see the skill set or the the job that they currently do is valuable. And I think when you see the inherent value in the person, in the work that the people that you will eventually manage are doing, it makes you much more likely not to let the power go to your head and to care that those individuals are successful. If I hear you, it's really the reluctance is maybe about some of the perceptions of managing managers around power and being sort of the boss's boss versus appealing to someone's desire to have a better work product, to have more leverage and getting a better outcome. Is that what you're saying, Jason? I think that's part of it. I, I guess what I'm saying is like the reluctance that I have experienced in this moment of like considering someone changing roles into management often boils down to, I really like being an engineer. I care about engineering work. Mm -hmm. I care about my colleagues and I like the relationships I have with my colleagues. That is often the source of the reluctance. And all of that are qualities that you want in a manager, right? Are people that cares about their colleagues, that cares mm -hmm. about the quality of the work that is being done, that values the craft of whatever it is that the people on their team are doing. So all of those things that fuel reluctance are also qualities of good managers. <laughs> I think also one should be a little leery when, when one is given some authority, one should yeah. be a little wary of that authority and, and not wanting it to corrupt you. And I think that's all for the good. If, if you're too eager for the job, I think that, I mean, so I'm sure there are some people who really care deeply about management and they're more interested in management than they are in being an engineer and and maybe that's all fine but so so nothing i'm saying is an absolute but i think that 
the reluctance and the skepticism of the role is well placed. You know, most people have had more bad bosses than good bosses. And yep. most people don't want to become that bad boss. And so I think that that's also part of what I like about that reluctance. Yeah, I think it's really well put, whether it's around the power, the authority, Jason, what you were saying around, I'm kind of having to give up the very things that most resonate. And I care uh, both about the people and the work product. You know, one of the things that also comes up as a manager of managers, this idea of indirect management that, you know, maybe you are managing five people and now you're responsible for a team of several hundred that you're not in direct contact with. And Jason, again, this, the conversation before the conversation, we were talking about this idea where there's a world where you're not in a command and control structure. And in that world, you're actually always indirectly managing. So whether you are managing a team of to the story that you might share around 12 people, it's not even about having a team of 400. It can start much smaller. So Jason, can you flesh that out a little bit for us about this idea of indirect management? Yeah, I think there's a temptation to believe that somehow the tasks of management become much different as the size of a team grows. And I think that's because when a team is small, you have the illusion of control, not because control exists, but because the illusion of control exists. And so my perspective is that great managers at any team size are aware that the only sense of control is an illusion and they work with that feeling. They, they, they recognize the importance of that. And in a world where you're doing creative work of any kind. It doesn't have to be engineering, could be marketing, could be sales. All this is creative work. You're dependent on people operate, like using good judgment and operating independently, making decisions without you in order for the team to be successful. By definition, that is indirect management. You're not controlling that person's behavior. You're not, you're not dictating the words that come out of their mouth. And so good management is founded on a discipline of in, indirect management. And so I just thought that this idea that somehow this need for indirect management appears as a team grows, it, like, is maybe missing the point of yes. what management should be about. Yes, 100% agree. Wow. All right. <laughs> we agree. We are not. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We maybe are you were hoping to create I was a looking fight, for. But we agree. No, we no I'm totally sure we'll get, we'll get to <laughs> that later. <laughs> what I think, at least if, if I am in this position, I am like anyone wanting to get into how can I actually succeed as a manager of managers? I mean, certainly one of the mistakes that I made when I was manage, I was managing five people. So I would, you know, those were my direct reports, but they were each managing five, 10 people who were in turn managing five, 10 people. So the team was, was you know, a couple hundred. And I, I really thought I needed to talk to all hundred, hundred and some odd people on the team. And so I set up all these like 15 minute one-on-ones every day with, you know, and people were global. So they were calls often. And I would say- just for the folks who aren't watching the video, I do think your head spun 360 degrees when you said global. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds like 15 minute one-on-ones with people is no big deal. It kind of was making my head spin. And I felt guilty about not doing it. And, you know, I'd sit down with these people and I'd say, this is your time to tell me what's anything that's on your mind. Anything is fair game from furniture to strategy. And I think that people thought it was a little weird. I think they felt that they were putting, they were being put on the spot. This was their 15. And it's not like this 15 minute conversation. I really got to know them. So that's an example of how I had to sort of let go of this illusion that I could get to know that many people, I couldn't even remember their name. And I had to be okay with that. And I think that is hard. That, I mean, at least it was hard for me. Kim, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like you had a different view on these 15-minute meetings with a larger team where you had talked about, obviously you have your direct reports, you have that smaller sphere of influence, but on the larger team, having conversations as a way to understand what was on people's minds and to build, even if you couldn't build a complete one-on-one relationship, it's how you heard about the offsites that people did or didn't want to have. Or And so I'm just curious, like, 
it seemed like there had been some value yes. in having when, connections when, with your team. Yes. When, when, I mean, I'm not saying never talk to anyone, but when a team is, when a team is like 40 people, you can have these 15 minute one-on-ones. When a team is a thousand people, you can't, right? At some point it breaks down. Uh, and so I, I did a bunch of things to try to scale this because when you're a manager of managers, the hardest thing about that is, is managing your time actually. And everybody kind of wants a piece of you and you want to give everyone a piece of yourself. And pretty soon you feel like you're getting gobbled up uh, if you're not careful. So one of the things that I did to try to scale that was just walking around and occasionally randomly talking to people that and booking an, you know, an hour a week in the calendar to walk around is very different from trying to book a thousand 15 minute one on one (laughs) with you know, it works better. And, uh, and you just have to be conscious of who you're talking with when you're walking around, that you're not always going up to people you do know, you're going to people you have never spoken with before. Pause on that one. I'm curious sure. if you have any tips or Jason, how we apply that in a hybrid environment where we're, you know, there's not, we may not be walking around in person, but just to have some of those touch points, is it just as simple as putting like a coffee hour on on a Google calendar? Or how, how do you think about that? One of the things that Kim, you're alluding to that I think is really important is that you have to become comfortable with not having direct knowledge of all the things that are happening. Or even, even who the people are. Like- right. right, right. And, and that, that is really hard for a lot of people, especially if you were around from the beginning of something. If you were there yes. when it was five people and now it's 150 people, it feels very different, even though a lot of the mechanics are actually the same, like how to be good as a leader in that, in that environment, the mechanics are, are stay very similar. You have to be comfortable relinquishing sort of knowledge and control. And so the idea of a tea time, a lot of people would say, well, you know, is that sufficient? Like who's going to come to that? Well, we have a standing meeting every two weeks with our coaches and People come to that meeting sometimes and they don't come other times. But what's really interesting about having that cadence of meetings available is that it allows for serendipity, allows for someone to have had something happen recently where they feel like, hey, I really want to talk about this. And now there's an outlet. There's a place that they can go and a time that they can go. And so at a minimum, I think things like a coffee hour or like a standing sort of semi-social gathering where people can bring an idea or a concern or a success that they they've had those kinds of things really matter but then as you grow bigger process starts to matter even more so like creating actual moments where you're giving people opportunities to share input and ideas explicitly that in ways that scale like staff meetings or all hands meetings and things like that becomes even more important And I think that for something like tea time or office hours or just a standing Zoom time, the the problem that I had, again, as teams really grew to be quite, you know, several hundred people, was that the same three people would show up. Yep. And most people Mm -hmm. wouldn't show up. And so one of the things, I mean, I tried a lot of different things. Some of them worked. Some of them didn't work. Maybe some of them could could work, but didn't work the way I, one thing I tried to do, I thought this was really funny. Other people didn't think it was so funny. I just basically, it was like the crank call from Kim. And I would just randomly (laughs) call people. (laughs) I'm starting to sweat already at the prospect of seeing your number. Why is my boss's 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 boss calling me? You know, some people found that funny and other people, but I'm like, so don't answer the phone. You know, I'll try the next person on the line. Dialing for dollars. Yeah. yeah. And another thing that, that we that we tried doing was setting up sort of like it was a global team. So we set up an always on camera in, in a, in a break area. So if you wanted to go see who was, who wanted to talk, you could go do it. I, I think that could be made to work. I could not figure out how to make it (laughs) work. So maybe somebody smarter than I can run with that idea. The other thing I, I have been thinking about lately is one of the ideas, like I'm, kind of introverted. And one of the things that I want from community is the freedom not to come to the meeting, (laughs) right? I was joking with my kids. I'm trying to get them to set up the introverts club. In in schools, there's all this pressure, like you got to 
lead this and lead that and show up and be at school all the time. I'm like, how about you set up an introverts club where you can go home if you want to and have a snack and watch a TV show and, <laughs> and not talk to people. And so I think that making room for both the extroverts and the introverts, giving the quiet ones a voice is something to think about. One of the ways that I think we've talked before about the ideas, the ideas team. Another thing that I've seen work is, is manager fix it weeks. I'll never forget this and stop me if I've already told this story. Basically, we took an instance of the bug tracking software that we had. And instead of using it for tracking software bugs in the product, we used it to track management bugs, like stuff that was broken in the way that we worked and that we wanted fit to get fixed. So people put in problems and then you could upvote problems and they were like P0 manager. And so one of the P0, uh, P0 for those of you who are not software engineers means this is the top priority thing to fix. It's like an emergency. What someone put in described what he had to do to take a bathroom break. He was on a, on a customer support team. <laughs> And it was like, it took him 20 minutes to get permission to go pee. And I'm like, gosh, by that time, I would be in real trouble. And so it's like P20. Yeah, that was, <laughs> was P20 bug. And I remember th there was this sort of meeting where he was describing this. Uh, and he was, you know, he had just been hired straight out of high school. And I remember my boss looking at him and saying, I am so sorry. I can't believe that I'm like running an organization that makes you do this. To and I think that's also something important. Like when you're leading a big organization and a manager of managers, things, bizarro things start to happen that you could never imagine happening. And you've got to be open to hearing about them and to fixing them without creating undue Blame. Like another example of that happening was there was a team that was in charge of, of policy enforcement. And the team was had been set up in another country, and you know, the management chain had gotten diffuse, shall we say. And I talked to the person who was leading that team about some problematic ads for bestiality that were showing up on some parenting websites. Like, so you can imagine, like there was a, and I said, you know, we have a policy that we're not going to approve these porn ads. And this person looked at me and said, well, bestiality is not porn. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't, this is not the conversation I thought I was going to be having today. Me neither. <laughs> No, <laughs> you all are all looking at me like we've already heard this. This is so boring. No, no, no. no I'm looking at you like I am just. So, but this is what happens when, you, when you're a manager of managers. Like things start to happen that you can't believe are happening on your watch. And you've got to be open to the fact that these things are happening on your watch. It's so, it was so, it would have been so easy for my boss to say, that would never happen, you know, on my watch that, that I can't, you know, I don't believe to refuse to believe that there was a process that made someone, you know, spend 20 minutes taking a bathroom break. So I'm, I'm really curious to drill down into like, what do you do next when you, so first of all, you're trying not to go right to judgment. I can't believe this happened or disbelief of, you know, what the person is saying, but, but then what do you do? How do you actually get to the root of what's happening? So in the, in the case of the pee break, my manager said, will anyone agree to own this problem and chase it down and understand why this happened to do kind of a, a postmortem? And someone raised his hand and agreed that he would chase this down. And he spent a lot of time. It took a lot of his time to fix it, but it got fixed, you know? So, so part of it is sort of not blaming, but asking someone to say, can someone figure out how to fix this rather than... <laughs> You know, what idiot set up this system? Uh, because it's easy to understand how those things happen. In the case of bestiality is not porn, what we did was we said, well, we, you know, let's take a look at the policies and the exceptions and make sure that we're constantly revising, you know, how we define these things. It just hadn't occurred to someone to make an explicit policy about bestiality. And so since it wasn't in the 
book, you know, and then the, the other thing that we did there is we asked the question, how can we allow people to apply common sense instead of just having to go by this? Like we need 94 million versions of if not yeah, A, yeah, then B. And, yeah, yeah. We needed yeah. actually a little bit more flexibility for people mm-hmm. to uh, apply their common sense in as they as they went through the policies. That is so helpful, can, Jason. I'm curious. Like, do you have? I'm sure you have some perspectives on how to synthesize. I was just thinking about how contradictory it seems that like you can't believe that this thing is happening on your watch, and the answer is to increase the amount of flexibility that people have. Yes, yes. <laughs> you gotta let control. You gotta let go of control because the more you try to correct everything that could go wrong with some kind of bureaucracy, then you're, then you're really stuck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I think there's a sort of belief that if I, the mat, the manager of managers know about the problem, then it will be solved correctly is a belief. But there's a side effect, which is that if everybody else believes that in order for a problem to be solved, you must know about it. Now you are a bottleneck. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so what's happening is like only the absolutely most critical problems like that are literally stopping things like work from happening are ever going to get solved. And all of these other problems that are slowing everybody down and making people miserable, they, ne- they don't actually rise to that level because you are the funnel through which all problems, mu- <laughs> all, all problems must, must be resolved. So there, yes, there's an Ian McEwan novel. I forgot the name of it, but it has a hot air balloon on the cover. And it, it there's a character in there. There's this accident that happens. And one of the characters said, everyone believed if only I were in, in absolute control of the situation, none of this terrible stuff would have happened. And I think that that, that is such, it, it's such a human belief. We all kind of think if, if I were in control of everything, then there would be sweetness and light. There would be no injustice, but there would be like all these problems that exist in the world would still happen. Even if you are in charge of the whole world, even if any of us wonderful yep. human beings that we are. We're in charge of the whole world. That was really my big aha, actually, when I started Juice Software. I started it because I thought if I were the CEO, if I were the manager of managers, if I were the fa- you know, the co-founder and the CEO, that everything would be fair and that, that all the kind of nonsense that I had experienced in my career I would get rid of it all. And I didn't. It was very humbling, actually. And I, I realized when when I stopped being the CEO and I went to Google and I had to sort of be part of a larger system, that one of one of the things that I admired about Google was that was that Shona Brown, who who built a lot of the systems at Google, had systematically stripped away control from managers the traditional sources of power for managers. And we've ta- I know we've talked about this before, but that was really important part of making sure that it was an environment where the managers of managers didn't s- start to get too power hungry. And also the managers themselves didn't get too power hungry, where innovation could flourish because freedom could flourish. That brings us very neatly to like the second big contradiction, it, which is that you are accountable even though you do not have control. Yes, as we talked about last time. <laughs> yeah. This is why it's so sad the discipline of management like building effective relationships, learning to influence as opposed to control gets sort of tossed aside as a soft skill as a soft yeah. skill even though it is like the way the that things thing get accomplished. To to do and yeah. and yeah. The, the foundation for successful business results. Yeah. Or so, any other speak, organizational result. Yeah. And I think just to steer us a little bit, you know, what managers of managers can do in terms of, of results, you know, one of the things that we've identified as four areas. So first of all, transparent goals, that would be number one. Two, Jason, you were just talking about this. How can we build better relationships through one-on-one meetings, which obviously we talk a lot about uh, at Radical Candor. Three what are the required management skills? You need to know the required management skills and competencies. And then 
Four, to actually hire managers with perspectives that are different, both from you as well as from each other. So I thought we would start double clicking on the first one, this idea of transparent goals, that managers and managers need to make sure that the goals line up and an OKR process can do this. And Kim, before we get into all these acronyms, KPI and OKR, can you share from your perspective what managers of managers, first of all, what OKRs and KPIs yeah. are and what, how, what is the role of managers and managers with regard to OKRs? Yes. Uh, I think actually, can we start with Jason, like building relationships? I think that's actually first. I mean, in my mind, here's what managers of managers are responsible for doing. They are responsible for creating the conditions for good relationships between their direct reports and the the people who work for them, right? So that so the relationships is foundational to everything. Then they need to create this culture of guidance, as we talked about. Then they need to talk about the team. They need to, you know, hire the team. And then the the fourth thing is they need to get stuff done. And part of getting stuff done is the OKR process. And I think that very often when people think about management, they think about goals first. But the goals are don't come first. I think the, f- the first thing is relationships. So, so Jason, why don't you talk a little bit about relationships and then I'll talk, uh, and then we can talk about guidance team and, and sort of get stuff done and OKRs. I feel like in this particular context, thinking about, you know, multiple layers of management I think this is this is much more popular now than it was even five or ten years ago. But the idea of evaluating the quality of relationships that people have with their managers as being essential to setting up a team for success, this is not something that everybody agrees is important. It is yes, not something that every company <laughs> evaluates. And so we talk this about is it our like podcast, and so we can <laughs> assert that this is the most important thing. Right, and and the reason I was mentioning it is is because I I think that sometimes I say these things and I'm like taking for granted a lot of a lot of agreement and I get sort of like a reaction every once in a while of just sort of like I hear you but I was having a conversation with a client recently and they shared with me that they had a goal and their goal was to sort of get uh people excited about sort of the the job of management, specifically about feedback, this sort of like ongoing feedback. And they said, you know, right now people don't necessarily see this as part of their job. And I I was like, but is it part of their job? Like, is it in the, is it in their job description? Like, have you, have, have you told them that it's part of their job? And they were like, well, no, this is like part of what we're doing now is, is sort of like introducing this idea. And I think that, That happens not infrequently when I dig in to talk and I talk to people who come to our workshop, to managers who come to our workshop, and I say, is relationship building, is the sort of like this fundamental aspect of management, is this part of your job? Is this part of how you're evaluated, how your success is evaluated? And often the the answer is is no. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Like this this is not one of my success metrics. And so from my perspective, as a manager of managers, if you want to build a strong foundation based on relationships, the absolute minimum standard is that it has to be part of the job description, like quality relationships with your direct reports has to be part of the job description. And then you need a way to actually measure that. And I think to your point, Kim, like you could have the best goals in the world. And if everybody has a terrible relationship with their manager, you're not going to get very many of those goals. Achieve those go- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the other thing, especially when you're a manager of managers, creating the conditions for good relationships is uh, earlier. I, I said this briefly, but I want to double click on it a little bit is you've, you've got to make sure none of the managers who work for you have unilateral decision-making power over who gets hired, who gets fired, and mm. and and who gets promoted, and how much gets paid. I think that 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 goes under the conditions for good relationships, not yep. team. Because the thing about 
that is, uh, and we've said this so many times before, but I think it's worth repeating. There are a few things that are worse for a good relationship than a power imbalance. And so one of your jobs as a manager of manager is to set systems up so that people, even when one person is reporting to another, they can build a relationship on a more or less equal footing. So in other words, you want to make sure that if someone who's working for someone who works for you is unhappy, that they can come to you. They don't have to only go to that person who's making them unhappy, right? Yep. Big, if you have a big enough team, you can allow people to switch managers you know, more easily. That's not always possible. That, that requires some scale. But that was one of the things, for example, at Google that I really liked. If, uh, although I was the, you know, it hurt me as well because people didn't like me and they left me, but without talking to me. <laughs> but if you didn't like your boss, you could switch teams without talking to your boss. Uh, and, yep. and I think that sort of being aware of how power can corrupt relationships is part of your job as a manager of managers. Kim, can I just ask on the personal front, like, how does that land when people on your team leave and go to other teams? Well, you know, I felt a little sad. I felt a little stressed. I went to the beach, like I watched the waves. But look, this is another thing about relationships (laughs) that's worth remembering. Sometimes there are bad relationships and you need to get out of them. And I... And very, I can really frustrate the hell. Not everybody likes to work with me. Like I change, as you all saw, I would, I will change everything every five minutes. If including if this I, podcast, <laughs> including the script. Yeah. The, the, just for, for listeners, this team asked me to get more involved in the script. And I think they might ask me not to next time. Like I, I kept changing it, but you all, all have a smile. Like it doesn't, it doesn't seem to bother you that much, but other people like it frustrates the hell out of them and they don't want to work with me. And this is something that is really important for the way that I work for being creative and innovating. And, and so I'm probably not, I'm, I'm not going to change it. And I don't want to, I don't want to force someone into my way of being. So, so I think part of being a good manager of managers or just a good manager is to realize that you are not the Hotel California. You know, people can check in, they can not like it, and they can leave you, and that's okay. I think the thing that is different about being a manager of managers and setting up a culture of guidance is that it's not enough to just solicit feedback from your direct reports. You have to make yourself open to public criticism when you are a manager of managers, because not everybody can get on your calendar when, when that's the case. And so if someone has some criticism of you, you want them to state it publicly so that you have the, it scales better. You have the opportunity to share with everyone on your team, your perspective on this or to apologize or to fix the problem. Like it does several things when you make yourself the exception to the rule of criticize in private and encourage people to criticize you publicly, you are more likely to hear about problems and you're more likely to be able to fix the problems exp- publicly. So you're, you're setting a good example for how to respond well to criticism and if you disagree with the feedback, it gives you an opportunity to explain why once and not not over and over. So I think that's one of the things that's different. And the, the last thing, we talked about this on the last podcast, but in order to create a culture of guidance, you need to make sure that people who work for the people who work for you can speak truth to power. And so you want to set up these speak truth to power meetings that we talked about last time. So I think those are some things that managers of managers have to do that managers of individual contributors don't have to do. That's so helpful, that framing. And Jason, when when we think about team, whether it's the required management skills about what this role means, this idea of hiring managers with perspectives that are different from you and each other, what's, what's your take when you would be looking to hire managers of managers that may be different from managers of individual contributors? Very often when I look up manager job descriptions, they look like senior individual contributor job descriptions. 
So if you're going to hire, you want to know what skills are really important to you. And so as we suggest, your company has uh, an expectation that managers have regular one-on-one conversations with people, that managers are responsible for understanding the career goals of people on their team and providing guidance to help them take a step in the direction of their dreams, if they're responsible for performance reviews, et cetera. Like all of that needs to be in the job description. And I would say, importantly, it also needs to be a part of the interview process because that's the other disconnect that I've seen with hiring managers is like, it's in the job description, but then the interview process is all about like, how deep are your technical skills in this particular, in the domain in which your team is going to be operating and how well have you delivered on business results in, in the past for, you know, similar teams. Those things make it into the interview and the management skills get sort of kicked to the to the curb. (laughs) They become last on the list. And then the last thing that I would say when I think about setting up a team is like for when you're hiring a manager, you have to be absolutely ruthless about reference checks. If you are afraid of calling someone up and finding out what it is really like to work with somebody, you are not ready to hire another manager. Like you, you, And you need to call people who worked for that person. For them, yes, yeah, yes. absolutely. Don't yep. call their boss, call their direct reports and and ask the hard questions. <laughs> and sometimes, wow, will you learn some stuff when you do that? Wow, well, it sounds like we do need a follow-up episode on this. It'll, yeah, it'll be a fun one. I think the another thing about the team, uh, I just want to double click on something Jason said, because it's really important. uh, And and because it triggered, uh, for me, a memory of a time when, again, when I was at Google, and Russ Laraway, who was on my team, came and he said to me, Kim, you know, you really value analytical skills. And you don't value my skills, like his skills, not that Russ is not analytical, but he, he, his, his real, Skill is managing people. I mean, and at the time I denied it, but he was, Russ was right. Uh, He was, it was totally legit criticism. I think that part of the reason why I tended to value the analytical skills was that I was over indexing on hiring people who were different from me. I think Russ and I were more similar in that way. Mm -hmm. And so you, you need to make sure that when you're hiring managers, that you are valuing management skills. Because that is such a part of success there and an area where I am ashamed to say that I failed. One of the many. (laughs) I mean, I didn't totally fail because I did continue to work with Russ uh, and start a company with him. So I learned from my failure. I'll put it that way. That's a more positive. Well, and we are all learning. We're learning from you. What I want to do before we close is make sure that we double click truly on this idea of KPIs, OKRs around setting goals. And I just want to bring in, and we'll put this in the show notes, some research from Microsoft Work Lab, this idea of productivity paranoia, which has very nice alliteration. But That's it so does talk sound- about that last time, didn't we? I love that idea. I know I think it was in a blog post. I don't know if we've talked about it yet, but hopefully Got folks it. will let us know. It's a fear among leaders that remote and hybrid employees are being less productive than they would be in an office full time, even though people are working more than ever. Close quote. And I think what's so interesting on this, what I'm reading beneath the the words here is going back to this accountability and control and trust. And it's one thing if I can walk around your desk and see you at your desk, but now who knows what's happening in this vast cloud of working from home and hybrid. And now my greatest concerns and fears are being realized. And so I'm just, I'm so curious, first of all, Kim, how that lands for you, productivity paranoia, and what do OKRs have to do with that? Yes. So productivity paranoia, I think this is like, once again, going back to control. You got to let go of control. (laughs) You know, you do feel, I mean, I think it's an illusion, but when, when, when you are physically with someone, you feel like you have more control than when you're not physically with them. At least most people do. I, my husband reminded me this morning that I tend to speak in absolutes, and I don't really think in absolutes. But, I think you so, said you never speak in absolutes. <laughs> I, 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 I often, I always, Kim, you always speak in absolutes. 
anyway, uh, so let's let's think about OKRs and and how they can or goals. Let's just call them goals, since uh, mm. since. Do you OKR, want to define what OKR actually meant yes. for people before OKR we move into goals? Is objective and key objectives and key results. So objective is we want to rid the wor- world of bad bosses, and the key results are we're going to do five million radical candor talks in the next year or so or something like that that's that that's how that works a lot of times. the objective is like the, the objective is kind of lost, lofty and then the key results are or should be measurable and it's similar to the idea of a of a KPI a, a key performance indicator now the OKR process and there's there's a book about this called measure what matters uh, that is probably worth reading but the idea of the OKR process, as it was practiced anyway at Google, there's also a really good video about it, which we'll drop into the show notes. But the idea of an OKR process is that everyone should write down their own goals. Like, what? here's what I'm going to try to achieve this quarter. The, these goals should not be imposed upon you from above. Like, your manager doesn't set your goals. You set your own goals. And you make them transparent. And then you kind of try to make them all line up. Like, and that kind of trying to make them all line up thing is where, you know, you kind of have to squint sometimes, but it works surprisingly well. For example, one of the moments in my career when I had to let go of control as manager of managers is when I first started leading the AdSense team, I would write the OKRs and I would have this theme for the year and a theme for the quarter and I would set the objectives and key results and then and then people would set their own goals that lined up with this vision that I had laid out which I thought was I thought I was doing a good job and then Scott Sheffer who was on my team came to me and he said Kim it's time for you to stop writing the OKRs that's not how it's supposed to be done you got to let the team come up with the OKRs and I was very nervous about it, but I was willing to go with it. Uh, Scott is very persuasive. And when the team came to me with their proposed OKRs, it was way better than anything I could have come up with. And so the idea of OKRs is everybody is transparent. They share what their goals are. And there's kind of like a period of negotiation where, where everybody sees everybody else's goals and you kind of have to negotiate. Uh, this, the, you know, your goal here is in conflict with my goal there and we got to work together to, to sort it out. But it, it is really effective if everyone knows what they're trying to accomplish and has tried at least to quantify whether they're winning or losing throughout the quarter and then make it transparent. Nick Bloom, who's at Stanford, has a lot of research on OKRs and and why they are important and why they don't work if the boss sets them. So that's a lot to absorb in terms of what goals or OKRs are. I'm curious, Jason, how does it land for you about the boss not setting the goals? I tend to agree that a boss should never set a key result for somebody else. Like a a boss should never be able to say, Kim, I'm making you responsible to sell X number of radical candor talks over the next 12 months. But I do think there are moments where it's actually quite important to communicate, especially through objective setting, like the direction that a company is going. And I think the squinting process is basically... Because like if people don't know collectively what they're trying to accomplish, I think it could be very hard to write. It could, you can feel sort of adrift in writing your own objectives and key results. And there are a couple of instances where I think there are some some key results that that matter that have to happen at the company level that may or may not get get written in the bottoms up process. So my my thing is like always start bottoms up as long as there's sort of a strategy that people are aware of and they generally agree on where things are going. I think you could start bottoms up. But if you get done with that and no one has mentioned that your startup needs to raise money in January. Yes. That is like it becomes quite important that you write an objective (laughs) or a key result, depending on on what level you wind up writing at, that says like we 
successfully raise whatever X million dollars, um, that becomes a key result. And a lot of the time that can be a key result that the, you know, that a, a CEO or an executive is responsible for. And so it can sort of also naturally fall out of this process. I have seen things get missed. And I think that's why the editing process is so important is because someone needs to square the the OKRs like with the yes. overall strategy of the organization. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And by the way, you as the manager of managers, you're not exempt from this process. So you Correct. have to write yes. your objectives and key results. And if everybody, if you say this is the week where everybody's going to publish their objectives and key results, like you should probably, <laughs> you should show yours first. And then the people who who want to read yours and allow yours to impact theirs, will do that. And some will not do that. And then, you know, you're going to have to have this editing process at the end where, where someone's off doing something that is either counterproductive or not helpful. But the only way that you know that this person is going to go off doing something that is counterproductive or, uh, or not helpful is if you let them publish their OKRs, like, t- like, tell me what you're really going to do next quarter. Mm-hmm. And, and and then you have an opportunity to persuade them not to say, because telling people what to do doesn't work, but to persuade them that if they do this other thing, it, you know, it, it'll work out better for them and the team. So yep. um, before we get into the tips, if someone who's listening, they don't have any system around OKRs or goal setting that corresponds to what you all were just talking about, is there like one next step, whether it's a book Kim, you mentioned a book, but just what's one practical thing that this person could do after listening to this podcast? So the thing that I would recommend is that you, if you, let's say you have a team of 20 people and you create a shared document, you can use a Google Doc or whatever shared document system you like, and you get everyone to write down what's their goal for the next quarter and what are the key results by which they will measure whether or not they've succeeded or failed in achieving that goal. That's awesome. I think just just bullet points. It just doesn't need to be that complicated. I I think just trying to, you know, take it out of people feel like, oh my gosh, it's some huge complex thing. Just boiling it down like you just did is, is fantastic. Let's wrap up with our radical candor checklist, additional tips you can use and start putting radical candor into practice. Tip number one for managers of managers, here are the conditions that you need to create so that good relationships can happen on your team. You need to make explicit for the people who you're managing that management is part of their job. You need to make sure that none of your managers have unilateral decision-making power over who gets promoted, who gets hired, who gets fired. Tip number two, as a manager of managers, you want to create a culture of guidance. In fact, all managers do, but specifically as a manager of managers, remember, it's not enough to just solicit feedback. You also have to make yourself open to public criticism. You also want to design systems that are going to enable people to speak truth to power. If you want more information on how to set those up, check out episode 14. And managers of managers need to build effective teams. That starts with hiring the right people and making sure that when you're hiring people, it is clear to them what skills, what management skills are going to be required. And don't forget to not only put that in the job description, but to make that part of the interview process as well as the reference check process. The best tip that I can give you is to call people who have reported to that person in the past and find out what they really think of them as a manager. And tip number four, as a manager of managers, you need to make sure that everybody's on the same page about what the goals are. And the best way to do that is what I call a bottoms-up OKR process or a bottoms-up goal-setting process. Bottoms-up. Tip number five. If you've already read Radical Candor and you want a refresher, and by the way, this goes out to anyone who's listening to the podcast, or if you're having a hard time actually focusing on reading an actual book, don't worry, you're not alone. You can still learn to be a better boss by watching the new Radical Candor Lit 
That's L-I-T, Lit Video Book. It's an hour-long adventure featuring interviews with folks who Kim mentions in the book. It's got cool animations, pictures of Kim from the Wayback Machine, and tips for practicing radical candor. Kim, anything on those pictures that you want to just speak very quickly to to tease how exciting this this video is? I know I was excited. You'll see a picture of me hating my job, sitting there drinking a beer at my desk, and you'll see a picture of me loving my work. But overall, the most important thing, the most meaningful thing, are the videos of people who uh, I've worked with over over the years uh, who are in the video. So thanks to everyone who played in making that video book. Awesome. And if you want to check that out, that's radicalcandor.com slash video book radicalcandor.com slash V-I-D-E-O-B-O-O-K. Stream it now. Well, for more tips, go ahead, radicalcandor.com slash resources. We've got learning guides for practicing radical candor. The show notes for this episode are at radicalcandor.com slash podcast. Go ahead, feel free to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Kim, this is that time. We love this time when we Don't hear you tell. Don't forget to buy and read my next book, Just Work, How to Root Out Bias, Prejudice, and Bullying to Create a Kick-Ass Culture of Inclusivity, available everywhere books are sold. We've still got that Radical Candor swag, radicalcandor.com. Clicking the shop link will take you to your very own choice of coffee mugs, sweatshirts, stickers, and more. Bye for now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com. Radical Candor.